<coughs> this morning we're in Luke chapter 6, Luke chapter 6. And we're going to be looking at just a couple of verses in Luke 6, but I would like to read the larger context because I think everything that our Lord tells us here will be useful to us in what we're looking at this morning. So what I'd like to read is Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 49. And what we have here is basically, well, either Luke's account of the Sermon on the Mount, although it doesn't seem to be that, to be the case, but perhaps another sermon that is very similar to it because of the place where our Lord actually delivers it is, is not said to be on the Mount, but rather He descends and delivers it from a plain. And yet we'll see a number of similarities between this and the Sermon on the Mount. But what I do want us to look at in particular is what our Lord Jesus Christ says regarding the heart, regarding the character, uh, what our lives say about what is in our hearts and how it is that our hearts are actually the source of everything that comes out of our lives, which is why it's so important that we watch over them diligently. Okay, so Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 20. And turning his gaze toward his disciples, he began to say, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. And whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High, for He Himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged, and do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Pardon and you will be pardoned. Give and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. And he also spoke a parable to them. A blind man cannot guide a blind man, can he? Will they not both fall into a pit? A pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone after he has been fully trained will be like his teacher. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take, the speck that, take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. For there is no good tree which produces bad fruit 
nor on the other hand a bad tree which produces good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush. The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good. And the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who has heard and has not acted accordingly is like a man who built a house on the ground without any foundation. And the torrent burst against it, and immediately it collapsed, and the ruin of that house was great. Well, may the Lord bless His Word again to our hearing this morning, as I'm sure He already has, as we even just heard what He had to say in this text of Scripture. Now again, I want us to focus on that passage where our Lord is talking about the heart and the character of the tree, by which He means, of course, the character of the person. What we do shows what we are, what we truly are inside. Now, Jesus tells us here that when He converted you, He actually brought about a, a fundamental change in your life, a change in that part of you that moves you to do what it is that you do. Now, we know from all the things that have come out of the Reformation that the Lord didn't act upon your will. He didn't have to change your will. You're still free to choose what you want. You still have free will, something which, of course, uh, our attention is always drawn to when we talk about uh, God's sovereignty. You've always had free will to choose what it is you want to choose. He didn't act on your will, but rather what He did was He changed what it is that determines your will. He changed your wants, He changed your desires, He changed your heart. Now before, when you were outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, your heart was evil, it was bad, and you did evil things. Jesus said you were like a bad tree. That could only produce bad fruit, the kind of fruit that the Apostle Paul has already pointed us to in Galatians chapter 5. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, Paul says that is what you were outside of Jesus Christ. You were a bad tree that could only produce bad fruit. But when He cleaned your heart out by His Holy Spirit, when the Spirit of God united Himself with your soul, He gave you a good heart. You became a good tree that could produce good fruit. Again, as Paul writes regarding the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. Now to walk in the Spirit of God and to produce that kind of of fruit. Jesus goes on to say not only did this clean up what it is you do with your life as far as your actions, it even cleans up what you say. Uh, what you said used to be dredged up uh, from an evil heart, like drawing up poisonous water out of a poisoned well. But now that your heart is filled with the Spirit of God, what you say is like drawing up sweet water from a gracious well. Uh, this transformation that Jesus brings about in the life affects even what you say. It affects every part of your life. I mean, the Lord is really pointing to this 
as the way that you can tell whether or not a person is a believer or not. It has to do with the kind of fruit their life produces. Jesus is pointing to this as to how you can know whether or not you know Jesus Christ. You can know that you do when you begin to live as Jesus lived, when you begin to speak as Jesus spoke. From within, not because other people are watching, not because you're being forced to, as it were, uh, through sermons or through the church or what you read in the Bible, but because you want to do that. Jesus has changed you from within. He's given you His Holy Spirit. You see, you can really know that He has done that by your outward actions because your outward actions really do show what is in your heart. Now, you can know that regarding yourself. That's one thing you can't know about other people. You don't know why they're doing the things they're doing. You don't know why they're, you know, saying the things they're, that they're saying, but you know why you are. If you know Jesus Christ, then you are doing these things because that's what you want to do. Because God has cleaned your heart, He's made you a good tree, you have a, a gracious well from which to draw to do these things. Now, we do need to recognize that Jesus says a good tree produces good fruit or it bears good fruit. But we also need to recognize this fact, it does not bear perfect fruit. We know that because of what the script, rest of the Scripture says about our hearts, even the hearts of believers that they are not perfectly clean. There's still sin in them. The old man has been crucified. His power is broken. You are free from your bondage to sin. Everything that you do now is actually uh, done with something of the Spirit of God in it. There is good in everything that you do, but there are still those remnants of corruption that pollute everything you do. If that wasn't true, then Paul really couldn't talk about putting to death the deeds of the flesh. He couldn't talk about putting off the old man and putting on the new. He couldn't say that you need to walk by the Spirit of God so that you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh because those desires are still there. They're still in your soul. Now, because both of these things are true, that you are a new creature in Christ, but that there are still remnants of sin, then there are two things that will be true of you if you know the Lord Jesus Christ. First, that you are a new creature with new abilities. You have powers now that you did not have before. And yet, you still will struggle with sin. So let's consider both of these for just a few moments. Now, first of all, <clears throat> Jesus says you're a new creature and you have new abilities. You're a good tree that can now bear good fruit because of the good treasure that He has placed in your heart by the Holy Spirit. This really gives you the power to do two things, to love what is truly lovely. Oddly enough, you, think, you would think you would need power to do that, but you do. And He's given you the power to love what is not lovely. So first of all, he's, this, this renewed heart that He has given to you, the fact that you're a new creature gives you the ability to love what is truly lovely. Now again, we do need to recognize before the Lord made you a new creature in Christ, before He opened your eyes to see His glory, you actually hated what is truly lovely. And what do I mean by that? Well, the Bible says you hated God. And God is the most beautiful, perfect being that could possibly be. Paul says that apart from His grace, you were not good. You didn't seek after God, that you hated God, and you were His enemies. I mean, not only did you hate God, but you hated His laws. You didn't want to submit to His laws because those laws reflected the same thing, the same beauty that you hated in God, which is His holiness. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. 
And because you hated God and because you refused to submit to His laws, the Bible says you were also rebellious and under the wrath of God. Again, these very familiar words of Paul in Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and notice, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest, those who are in this condition, are under God's wrath. They won't see heaven, but only hell unless they repent. Now, that's the condition you were in before you came to Jesus Christ. But when He cleansed your heart by His Spirit, He made you into a new creature and gave you the power to do what you could not do before, to love that which is truly lovely. Now again, recognize it's not that these things weren't lovely before, they, they were always beautiful. God has always been beautiful, holiness has always been beautiful, it's the right and good thing. It's only that you couldn't see it because you were blinded by your sin. You were bound by sin, and that's all you love, and so you hated holiness. But now God has opened your eyes. Now you can see, and because you can see its beauty, that is what you want. Now you love God's image wherever you can see it. You can see it in Him, and so you want to love Him. As a matter of fact, if you're a Christian, if you know Jesus Christ, you love God more than anything else, and you want to love Him, you want to serve Him, and you're grieved when you can't do that. You love what you see of that holiness in His people, and so you want to minister to one another, and you want to fellowship and spend time with God's people. And that same love for what is good also makes you not love fellowshipping with people who aren't like Jesus Christ because that unholiness provokes you. It's not hard for you to, to love these things now because now it's your nature to do that. You have a new nature. Your heart is going to draw you out to these things. That is the power that the Lord has given to you. Actually, to love Him, to love His Son, to love His Spirit, to love His people, to love His law, to love His worship, to love everything that has to do with the Lord to do all this from the hearts, not because you're being compelled by anyone, not because you're keeping up appearances, but because you really want to do this from the heart. But I said that He gave you the power not only to love what is truly lovely, but He's also given you the power to love what isn't lovely. And that's maybe something we're a little less familiar with, but I think you know what I mean. What I mean is that you can now love those things that don't reflect. His holy image. Now, I'm not saying you should love sin. What do I mean? Jesus calls you to love your enemies in the same way that God loves His enemies. We read that already in Luke chapter 6, verses 35 and 36. Jesus says, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for He Himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Jesus says when you love your enemies, you're doing what God Himself does. Now, we have to admit this is one of the hardest things that the Lord calls you to do in His Word because, how, it, you know, how can you love those who hate you? That's what an enemy is, is somebody who hates you. It's easy to love those who love you. Jesus says even sinners can do that. And even those who may not necessarily be loving you, but who are lovely in and of themselves because they have the image of God being formed in their souls. But what about those who have nothing of His image? And what about those who actually hate you and do nasty things to you and really are never sorry about it? How can you love someone like that who isn't lovely? Now, you can't because of what you see in them, because there isn't anything good in them. 
So how can you do what the Lord calls you to do here? Well, you can only do it in the same way that God does it because God doesn't, didn't see anything lovely in us either when He set His affection on us and when God does kind things for the ungrateful and evil men, He doesn't do it because of any good thing He sees in them. I mean, when we read this text of Scripture, John 3.16, what, what is Jesus actually saying here about God? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. You know, when most Christians read that passage, they say, you know, God's love is such that it's drawn out to, to evil man. God loves them because, because of them, and He loves them all the same. But what kind of people is, is God actually loving here? Not those who are lovely, but those who are His enemies. Basically, He's loving the same kind of people that you were like before the Lord changed you, people who hated Him. God could not love them for what He saw in them. So how is it that God loves them? The only way that He can is for His own sake. You see, it wasn't what was in them that drew His love out to them, but rather what was in His own heart that drew Him out. The reason for His love is in Himself. It's not in the object. Uh, Paul tells us in Ephesians 1, verses 5 through 9, and I want you to pay close attention to a couple of phrases in here. Paul writes, in love, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, note, according to the kind intention of His will. To the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, note, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us. In all wisdom and insight, He made known to us the mystery of His will, note, according to His kind intention, which He purposed in Him. In love... The kind intention of His will, the riches of His grace, His kind intention which He purposed in Jesus. I want you to notice that the reasons that Paul gives for the blessings that He bestows on us have nothing to do with us, but everything to do with God's grace, His love, His kind intention. In other words, the love is in God's heart and He shows it. It's not that the object drew it out, but God chose to show it. So it had really nothing to do with us, and it has nothing to do with these objects of sinful man. It has everything to do with Him. John tells us in 1 John 4, 19, we love because He first loved us. God's love is what draws Him out to an object that is unlovely to be able to show kindness and mercy even to those who are His enemies. Now, the point is this, God has put that same love into your hearts. He has given you His Spirit so that you can love now what you didn't love before. I mean, you, you can now love what is truly lovely, as we've seen. But now you can also love that which is not lovely, just as He does. Uh, that's what this new heart gives you the power to do, to love your enemies as God loves His enemies, to love your enemies as Jesus loved His enemies, to love your enemies as Jesus calls you to love your enemies. So the Lord has cleansed your heart by His grace. He has made you a new creature with new abilities. Now you can love that which is truly beautiful, which you couldn't before, which is why you trust in Jesus Christ and why your heart draws you out to do the things He calls you to do. And that includes loving what is not lovely in itself. You can even love your enemies. You are equipped to do everything that the Lord calls you to do by the Spirit of God He has put within your heart. But now let's not forget the second point which we wish was not true but is true, and that is you still have remaining corruption 
that is always going to be there to get in your way. And you know it's going to do it in at least two ways. First of all, it's going to make you resist doing what your heart now wants to do, what is good and right. And it's also going to make you want to do what is bad, what is wrong, what is sinful, what is evil. You need to understand that as a Christian, you have a desire against God's will. And you have to wrestle with it. You have to fight against it. You know, being a new creature doesn't mean that obeying God is going to be an easy thing. It just means that it's possible to obey God. That sin that is in you is going to make it difficult. That's why Paul wrote to the Galatians in Galatians 5, as you've already read. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Now, the net result of this is whenever you set out to do something that is good, and it doesn't matter what it is, your flesh is going to be there to resist it, to fight against you, to try to get you to do something else, either something else that's worthless or something else that's sinful. If you want to sit down and read your Bible, if you want to spend time with God in prayer, your flesh is going to spring up and it's going to fill your mind with so many other things that you need to do, so many other things you would rather be doing than doing this. If the Lord provides you with an opportunity to witness to someone else, the sin in your heart is going to try to convince you to go another direction. Your mind, it's going to work on your mind to try to convince you, you don't need to witness to this person. They probably already know Jesus Christ anyway, and you're just wasting your time. Or maybe what God says really isn't true, and this guy's going to get upset with me for nothing. Or somebody else is going to witness to them. Or somebody else can do it better than I can. So why should I even try? And so you end up not witnessing to them. When you attempt to do something useful with your life, anything you seek to do for the glory of God, such as getting ready for life, training for life, schooling for life, so that you can provide for yourself, provide for your future family, or maybe help others in some way, your flesh is going to work against you. It wants to destroy you. It wants to derail what you're doing. It wants to shipwreck your plans. Now, it may not seem like it is because when it happens and when it tries to convince you otherwise, it's always going to give you a better reason than I'm trying to destroy you. It's going to try to convince you that it's doing something good for you rather than something bad. I mean, here's an example from Solomon regarding uh, the, the sluggard and how he looked at what he was doing versus what was really happening to him. He says in Proverbs 24, verses 33 and 34, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Then your poverty will come as a robber and your want like an armed man. Well, from the sluggard's perspective, it's just a little sleep, just a little slumber, just a little bit of rest. What's the big deal? Well, you just keep thinking that way, Solomon says. That's the excuse your sin is using. But realize that if you continue down this path, poverty is going to come upon you like a robber, like an armed man. Now, not only is your sin going to fight against you when you want to do something good, it's also going to continually try to get you to do something bad. And in order to do that, it's going to try to change your perspective on what God says. It'll make you look at what God says as being something bad when it's really something good. And it's going to make you look at what God says is bad as though it is really something good. Uh, Thomas Brooks had, I think, a, a good way of putting this. He says it will paint, well, this is kind of the opposite of what Brooks said, and I'll say what he said. It will paint virtue with vice's colors. In other words, this isn't really a good thing, it's a bad thing. But it's also going to paint vice in virtue's colors. God says not to do this, but it really is a good thing. And you need to do this. 
Now, realizing that that is the character of sin and that that sin is in your heart, is it any wonder that the Lord says through Jeremiah the prophet in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Do you realize that that's true even if you are a believer here this morning? That is true. You cannot trust your heart. You cannot go by your impulses. You can't make decisions by what feels right. You know, we talk about people who make rational choices and people who make emotional choices. In many cases, both of those may be wrong. You need to make decisions by what the Word of God says. Every day, the people of the world are making decisions based upon what feels good to them. They're like blind people leading the blind if you follow them because they shipwreck their lives every single day and they destroy them because that is the way they operate. What do I want? What do I feel like? What will be good for me? What will be fun? What will be pleasurable? What will bring the greatest amount of pleasure right now? That's what the world does. That's what sin does. It's self-centered. It's pleasure now. It doesn't look at the long hall, the long, you know, the picture of what's coming ahead. Because what if you gain the whole world, but you lose your soul? What have you actually gained? You've gained an eternity of suffering. But if you give all these things up for the pleasures and joys that are coming, then you've gained an eternity of pleasure. So you need to realize that even though you are a new creature in Christ with new desires and abilities, you still have this enemy to contend with. You cannot trust your heart. You need to trust God's Word. Okay. Well, that's kind of jumping ahead to what the final point is. Realizing both of these things are true, what should you do? Well, you need to do what Solomon exhorted us to do in the meditation. It's Proverbs 4.23. This would be a good one to memorize, by the way. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Understanding that your heart is the source of all these things that are going on, your desire to do what's good and your desire to do what's evil, you need to watch over it. And what does Solomon mean by that? He means you need to guard it. Guard your hearts. Watch over what's in them. Watch over what you put in them. Watch over what comes out of them. You need to guard it. Now, if you haven't come to the Lord Jesus Christ, I hope you realize by now that you have really nothing to guard because all that's in your heart is sin. The Lord says your heart is rotten, full of corruption. And it needs to be cleansed before any good thing is going to come out of it, before you're going to be able to come to the Lord Jesus Christ and trust Him and turn from your sins. Only Jesus can cleanse that, which is why you need to come to Him and ask Him for His mercy and ask Him for His Spirit, which alone can make you into a new creature with these new desires. Only the Spirit of God can break the chains of sin and set you free, you have to come to Him and He has to set you free and, and if He does, then you may trust Jesus Christ and turn from your sins as you can. So you need the grace of God to change your condition. But secondly, if you already have come to Him, you need to guard what the Lord has given to you of His Holy Spirit. You need to expose yourself continually to the things that God has given you that will strengthen His work in your hearts. And you need to stay away from the things that will weaken it. Everything you do, every decision you make, everything you expose yourself to, everything you listen to, even everything you do and say is affecting your heart. And the degree to which the Spirit of God is influencing you, every single thing you are exposed to, every single thing you do, either strengthens or weakens the influence of the Spirit of God. So you need to guard your heart and not put those things in there that will weaken it. 
but rather those things that will strengthen it. And then finally, of course, realizing you have this other influence in your heart, this flesh, this sin. Rather than feeding it, the Lord says you need to do everything you can to try to kill it. Because every time you listen to it, it will lead you astray. Every time you give in to it, it will weaken you in some way and strengthen its own influence over your heart. And Paul says that if you continue to listen to your flesh and if you continue to follow your sin, that it actually will kill you. And Paul says this in Romans 8, verses 12 through 14. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Now, does Paul mean here that if you give in to the flesh more and more, you'll reach a point where you'll actually kill the grace of God in your, in your soul? No, he's, he's not saying that you can lose your salvation. What he's saying is that if you live according to the flesh, then you're not saved. You don't have the grace of God at all in your hearts, and when you die, it will be eternal. You may look like you're alive. You might have a profession that you are alive, but you're really dead. So you're not, in essence, being put to death. You're just simply showing that you're already dead. Those who know Jesus Christ, Paul says, walk by the Spirit. And they put their fleshly desires to death. And so this passage really asks you the question, besides all the instruction that we've already received from it this morning, it also asks you this question. What is it that is in your heart? If, if your life shows that it hasn't been cleansed by Jesus Christ, then come to Jesus Christ and be cleansed by His grace. Ask Him for His Spirit. Ask Him for His mercy. He is gracious. He is merciful. But if you know Him, it also tells you, guard your hearts. Fuel it with the things that will strengthen His love, that will give you spiritual strength to do His will and to become more like Jesus Christ and to fight against the things that your sin will do to weaken it. In other words, be filled with the Spirit. That's the bottom line. You need to be filled with the Spirit. Look at what's inside your heart. If, if it's not filled with the Spirit of God, then seek to be filled with the Spirit. Let me just tell you that there is more. There is more of the Spirit than what we experience. There's always more. We can never have enough, and there's always more. And if we don't, <clears throat> excuse me, if, if you don't see what you would like to see in your life, it's because you need more of the Spirit of God. So understand how you get more, understand what it is that weakens his influence, understand that it does matter what you do with, you know, the decisions you make and the things you do with your life, what you, what you are doing with your life and what you're exposing yourself to. All of these things influence this. And if you don't see Jesus Christ in your life the way you want to, it's because you're not doing what the Lord says you should be doing to get more of the Spirit of God, and you're not holding on to it and guarding it. You need to be filled with the Spirit. I need to be filled with the Spirit. Jesus Christ was filled with the Spirit above measure. If you want to be like Jesus Christ, you need to be filled with the Spirit of God, and that will make you what you want to be in Jesus. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, and let's ask that the Lord would take what we've heard, that we would be able to hold on to it, not forget it, and, and apply it, benefit from it, and become more like Jesus Christ through it. Let's spend a few moments in prayer.